Hi everyone, welcome back to another cool cube video. Uh, my name is Ayush and in this video we'll be going over recursion versus iteration, which are problem solving techniques that are especially useful in mathematics and computer science. Uh, later on in this video we'll have an example in Python. But to start, let's just go over what recursion means and what iteration means. So the first thing uh, to note is that recursion is simply defining a function. So let's just call it f of x. And having that function be composed of another call out to that function. So for example, if we have f of x equals something something, then we have either times plus any operation, and then f of z, so some other constant, and then something else afterward. That function would be recursive because we call the function in its definition. So we can think about this as trees, which are especially useful in other areas of computer science and mathematics. But let's just say that we start at one function call. So we say f of 10, for example. And then in that f of 10, we call f of some other number two times. That would give us the tree shown below, right? Because, for example, at the point where we branch off, right over here, we see two function calls. Then, when those function calls occur, we're calling the same function, so we would call it again two times, which causes it to split again over here two times, and again over here two times. This process repeats, and eventually we get a full-fledged tree, each with two branches per node, per se. But one might ask, how does the tree ever end? Wouldn't it just keep going forever? Well, this is where the base case comes in. So a base case is a place where we stop recursion. For example, we could say f of 0 is 0. So using that logic, we would eventually reach f of 0, which causes our tree to end. Right there. So that would be our base case. So when our base case is reached, we cut off the tree because we know the actual answer. And in recursion, you need at least one base case, but oftentimes you'll have two, three, four, or many more. And uh, quickly, another definition that might be useful is branching factor, which in this tree is two. You'll notice that the tree always splits off into two distinct branches. But of course, in programming problems, we could have many different uh, numbers of branching factors. So we could have a branching factor of 10, we could have it of 1 if you just keep calling the function at a factor of 1. Then we have iterative, which is really the much more straightforward, simple approach to problem solving, which is f of x equals something. And that something happens not to include f of x. It can include g of x, for example, as long as g of x doesn't include f of x. So think about this as any straightforward function. So for example, f of x equals 3x, f of x equals 4x, f of x equals x squared. None of them call f of x from f of x. So we don't, we would consider f of x equals anything that doesn't have f in it iterative. And again, this is straightforward and really simple. Okay, now let's move into a programming perspective or aspect of recursion and iteration. Uh, one way we can look at this is thinking about the Fibonacci series. So the Fibonacci series is simply numbers that are dependent on the two previous terms. So let's do, let me just write it out here, right? So one, one, those are the two starting terms. After that, we have 2, because 2 is the sum of 1 and 1. Then we have 3, because 3 is the sum of 2 and 1. Then we have 5, because 5 is the sum of 3 and 2. And then we have 8, which is the sum of 5 and 3. So we simply sum the two previous terms to get the next term. And the key is that we start at 1 and 1. So how would we approach this programmatically? Well. Uh, I'm going to do it in Python here, but feel free to 
try it on your own in a, the language of your choice. But we start off by defining a function. Let's do it fib x. What is a natural way to approach this problem? Well, naturally, we know that a Fibonacci number is simply a sum of the pre two previous terms. So we can say all we're doing is returning fib of x minus 1, right, the previous term, plus fib of x minus 2, which is the term before the previous term. But how would we ever stop? If we ran this, we would get a recursion error. Let's try it. Let's say fib of 5. Well, maximum recursion depth reached. So what is the issue here? Well, we don't have any base cases. As we talked about at the beginning of the video, we need at least one base case. The easy way to do this is think about what I said at the beginning. When x is 1 or 2, we can just return 1 because we know that those are the two base cases. So in this case, we can say fib or we can say if x equals equals 1 or x equals equals 2, return 1. Now this should work, right? If we try again, let's say fib of 1. Obviously we would expect a 1. Fib of 2. The second term we expect a 1. Fib of 3. What would we expect? A 2. And so naturally we can take this to larger numbers like 8, 21. So yeah, I think you guys can get the point here. But this is the recursive way to approach this problem. Because in our definition for fib, we are using fib. So fib calls itself until we reach a base case. Another thing to note here is that if x is negative, or even if it's zero, our program will fail because there's no base case for a number that's negative and we always go downward. That's just something to notice, which we could fix if we wanted to, but then again, Fibonacci, you don't have a negative number, negative term. Okay, now let's think about doing an iterative approach to this problem. So let's say fib, def, fib, iter, x. So how could we approach this problem using a for loop instead of recursion? Well, let's just set up two starting numbers because we know that we're going to have some form of a base case, not a base case, but some place to go back to. Now let's think about how we can define our for loop. So we can say for in range, which is just a way of saying up to some number. Let's do x minus 2 because in this case we know that if x is 1 or 2 we already have an answer so we don't have to go through those iterations. Let's say we're starting at 1 and 1. Let's say that temp is equal to i so the previous, previous term, i is equal to j, and then j is equal to temp plus j. So now the new second term is just the first term plus the second term from before. And we set 
the first term, the first, in the sense, the previous previous term to the previous term from last time. So essentially what we're doing here is we're incrementing the last two terms. And then at the end, we just return j, because that's the latest term. Now let's try this out. Let's do 8, for example. See? And we got 21. Let's try 11, because we know we did that with... And there you go, 89. So our program works here. Now, one interesting thing you might notice is that it looked like our iterative function was faster. And indeed it is, because we do less function calls. So although the recursive method is much cleaner in that it's shorter, it is not more time effective. So if we want a fast program, we would prefer to write iteratively. And another benefit of this, in, at least in Python, is that we don't have to worry about recursion bounds, because when you write a program iteratively, it's not calling itself. So for example, if we uh, go back to our recursive function, we could do fib of 100 or 1000, we get a maximum recursion depth exceeded, where if we did fib, fib iterative, we get our number almost instantly. So although it, recursion is a powerful tool, it's not always what we need. So in this case, we figured out that we can write Fibonacci iteratively and recursively, but we would much prefer to use the iterative function if we care about time and we care about how large a number we can get. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next.